Marsa.
Use your, use your firefighter voice, Dan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it's okay. So, do you want me to just like introduce myself quick, and then and then I'll do it, and then I'll just kind of go into it, and I'll say Dan's going to do a presentation, and I have a few words to say, and we'll do a Q and A. Okay, sounds good. All right, everyone, uh, please have a seat. We're going to get started here in just thirty seconds, how about or less. Okay, um, let's get started. Um, I'm going to just introduce myself briefly. I'll turn it over to Matt, and then we both have some comments. And then we also really want to have this be an opportunity to have a conversation, too. I know some of you probably have some questions, but um, we'd really love it to be, you know, informal and really kind of see what's on your mind. Um, but it really excited to be here, first of all. I really want to thank um, Christian and, and new president Brad and uh, all the leadership at Club 20 um, for inviting us to, to participate in this really important forum. Uh, today, I've been involved with, with Club 20 for uh, quite a few years now. Uh, I lived in Gunnison as a kid. I'm a West Sloper, uh, live in Summit County now. And um, I'm the head of the Department of Natural Resources. So it includes uh, quite a few different divisions. I just wanna give you a quick snapshot of everything that entails, but um, we have a water conservation board. They do um, all the kind of water plan grant programs, the, the basin round table meetings. Um, yes, Commissioner Sakata is in the back room <laughs> who represents the South Platte for, for water conservation board. Good to see you, Robert. Um, and uh, Division Water Resources, they handle water administration throughout the state. Parks and wildlife, we have 42 state parks and manage all wildlife in the state that are not endangered or threatened. Um, we have Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. We regulate about 49,000 active wells in Colorado. Um, Division of um, um, Reclamation Mining and Safety, we have seven active coal mines. We have a lot of different aggregate mining and gold mining and so forth. So we regulate all the extractive industries. Uh, state Land Board, uh, we managed 2.8 million acres and last year brought in $177 million for K through 12 education. And then Colorado Avalanche Information Center. So for those that love backcountry skiing or snowmobile uh, enthusiasts, we try to provide the best uh, available information on you know, snow safety around the state. And then last but not least is, is a great tie into Matt is we have a division of forestry but that's all run through the Colorado State Forest Service. Um, so that's kind of a snapshot of you know, what we do in the Department of Natural Resources. So kind of everything the state to do is land, water, wildlife, minerals, and oil and gas. Uh, next, I'll turn it over to Matt. Thanks, Dan. So again, my name is Matt McCombs and I'm the State Forester and Director of the Colorado State Forest Service. Uh, we're a service and outreach organization uh, housed in the Warner College of Natural Resources at Colorado State University. Uh, we also provide staffing and technical support to the Division of Forestry and, and DNR. And uh, we're really looking forward to having this conversation around flipping the paradigm, um, thinking of forest management as a tool, acknowledging that uh, you know, there are very uh, large, very uh, opinions about, uh, about how forest management is laid out on the ground and what the, the benefits and, and drawbacks are. So, the way we're going to run this is, is Dan has a brief presentation, then I have a few remarks, and then, yeah, our, our goal is really to have more of a dialogue uh, than, than a presentation from us. Um, so go, go ahead, yeah, Director Dean. Great. Thanks, Matt. Um, you know, first of all, just thinking of the paradigm shift, um, I, I think there's one thing that we need to be aware of, too, is, is you know, when you have certain catastrophic events, uh, people start thinking a little bit differently, I would say, about forest health um, and proactive management. And I'll just kind of share with you what I think over the last few years have been, you know, big time events that have kind of changed this paradigm. Uh, number, th number one, you know, we had the three largest wildfires in Colorado history um, happen um, in 2020. Um, and then on top of that, um, just last year um, with a Marshall fire that burned over a thousand homes, um, we have the average warmer temperatures right now than the 1930s Dust Bowl era. Um, we have snowpack that's 
average right now, you know, Colorado River is about 99%. Gunnison Basin's 114% right now, your old neck of the woods. Um, but it's very much kind of an average year. But here's the kicker. The snow moisture content um, for moisture within the ground is, is, is very different. It's, it's way off. You have to dig down, you know, six inches, eight inches in certain spots to find that same moisture content that we used to have, you know, just a few years ago. So that really has an impact on, on flows. Um, and then here's um, really an important component. You know, we're seeing more and more people move to, to Colorado. Um, some of the more recent figures reflected, there was a time it was like 50 to 60,000 new people, believe it or not, moving to the state a year. And the most recent figures reflect that we have right now about one and two Coloradans that live within the wildland urban interface. So where your home is adjacent, you know, to forested or grassland areas that, you know, could have a high susceptibility of, of wildfire behavior. Um, so I think those, you know, areas um, are definitely kind of, uh, creates a new um, kind of interest, I would say, to say the least, in, in Colorado. Um, for me personally, um, just thinking of um, this paradigm shift that, that we're looking at, um, looking at defensible space and forest health issues is something that's really near and dear to my heart. Um, I live in Summit County. Uh, it's a community that we've seen some, some wildfire activity. Um, and we're really um, a community that I think has really come together uh, in terms of um, let's let's bring everyone to the table. Let's figure out how we can um, do some meaningful projects that will protect lives, property, and critical infrastructure. Um, I'm a former legislator. I used to serve in the House and Senate, and my um, the salary was so lousy back then. It's, it's still kind of lousy, but my side job was Summit County's wildfire mitigation specialist. So I'd go like literally door to door at times, you know, working to make recommendations on defensible space. Um, Deborah, I've been to your house helping you out <laughs> at one point. <laughs> Hopefully I did a good job at your house. <laughs> um, but, but literally, you know, folks would call up the, the local fire department and so forth, and I would, you know, work with, with the department to, to make recommendations. Um, and then, you know, I, I rattle off all those different topics that the Department of Natural Resources has right now. And I really just wanted to, like, share with you that's a long list of areas that we cover, land, water, wildlife, minerals, oil and gas. But to tell you the truth, the forestry stuff is really near and dear to my heart, to say the least. I just um, really have a, have a great passion. I really appreciate Matt's leadership you know, at the State Forest Service now. Um, let me just look at, um, I have a few slides I wanna share with you all. See if this, oh yeah, you wanna, that's great. Um, it's, the, it's the one next to, the arrow. Okay. Yeah. So um, you can see, oh, that's weird. Can you click one more? I want to show. Okay. Maybe go back. Yeah. Okay. So this, this, this slide shows, you know, Boulder County, almost a hundred years apart. So you can see um, on the bottom left, um, you know, the density of the forest was not, you know, similar to what it is, you know, right now. Um, in Colorado, we've done, you know, a really good job of suppressing fires. As I mentioned, you know, we have one in two Coloradans that live within the wildland urban interface. There's an expectation that local fire departments are going to get out there um, as, along with the state. It's great to have Sam and, and Ryan here with us, too, the Division of Fire Prevention Control. They do an amazing job of working with local communities, too. Um, but, but, you know, if we don't have the suppression, then, you know, trees will, will eventually die of, you know, a drought, disease, you know, sometimes wildfires. Um, and obviously we can't harvest everything, but, um, but there's definitely landscapes, oh, it looks a lot better, um, you know, that, that we can focus on. Let's go to the next um, slide. Oh, yeah, I think, I think that's all right, yeah. Um, so we've, we've seen, you know, in the news, obviously, um, wildfire, smoke, uh, post-fire flooding, debris flows, um, impacts uh, communities big time. Um, I was on uh, both the Grizzly Creek fire last, or a couple of summers ago, and the Cameron Peak fire. And um, pretty amazing when you look at, you know, what those impacts have, uh, not only on water quality and quantity, but when you think of the Grizzly Creek fire, um, you know, the rafting industry, for example, is a multi-million dollar industry that was literally shut down, you know, for a big part of the summer as a result of that particular fire. 
um, we all, there was also a study that was conducted on I-70, um, and this was done back in, I want to say 2005 or 26, that reflected that every hour the I-70 mountain corridor shuts down equals about a million dollars of lost revenue. So, um, so this really impacts, you know, local economies, you know, big time to say the least. Um, and let's go to the next slide. Okay, so, you know, when we look at our um, plan of, of, you know, how we're working to, to move a paradigm shift and so forth, you know, I think it's important for everyone to recognize, and, and Matt and, and Frank Bem earlier today uh, discussed the, the shared stewardship MOU that is really, a, it's really the state and the U.S. Forest Service um, laying out a plan on how we work together. And it's not just on forestry issues, but it's how we work together on trails, how we work together on um, the growth that I mentioned the state's occurring, how we deal with like, you know, parking issues and, and really working together. But this 2019 framework, you know, really helps um, make sure that, that we're on the same page as state of Colorado and the U.S. Forest Service on looking at the right pace, uh, the right location, and the right scale. And I can't stress those three words enough. You know, the, the pace, location, and scale is so important when we think about kind of paradigm shifts in, in working on forest health issues. The, the U.S. Forest, is anyone here with the U.S. Forest Service? I know Dan is. Um, but, you know, there's and Frank's in the back room, but, you know, there used to be kind of like almost a saying that, you know, hey, we're going to get some projects done. And, and it was like almost like the random acts of restoration, you know, like, hey, we have quotas from Washington, D.C., and we need to make sure that we're fitting the quotas. But, you know, is it the right location? Is it the right, you know, pace? Um, are local communities, you know, uh, supportive of that as well? And it's been kind of a mixed bag, but I, I really appreciate um, the shared stewardship uh, MOU that we have now that really spells out exactly, you know, how we work together and collaborate, which, which at the end of the day, I think minimizes the threat of, of lawsuits as well, um, which I think is, is important as well. Let's go to the next slide here. So this is a photo too of, um, of, of a photo actually in Summit County in the Peak 7 neighborhood um, in, in the Breckenridge area. Um, it was, the photo was taken from the State Forest Service 2021 Forest Action uh, Report that, that really you know, highlights this really important fuels break. And in Summit County, um, thinking of kind of paradigm shifts, like I remember so vividly you know, years ago, um, when, um, I don't know if Nancy Fishering is in the room here, but there'd be like, you know, Nancy Fishering and like Carl Spaulding. Carl, Carl you know, as a participant with Club 20 in the past, but he's a former um, head of the Colorado timber industry, sit next to Karn Stiglmeyer, who used to be a Summit County commissioner, but at that time was the head of the Sierra Club for, for the region. And I can't tell you um, how important having a local forest health collaborative uh, was in Summit County to get projects off the ground, to kind of almost switch a paradigm, if you will, of, of you know, not looking at, you know, the, the timber industry and trucks that come through as, as oh, you know, they're anti-environmentalists or they're, they're here to, you know, take down all the trees or whatever, but really focus on, hey, they're here to work with our community. We know we live in a community that's, that's prone to wildfires and they're gonna play a really important role in helping to protect lives, property, and critical infrastructure. We know how much money, you know, Denver Water, Aurora Water, Colorado Springs Utilities, all the biggies have put, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, defensible space, but also, you know, watershed restoration because they know that when we do have fires, that it's a big deal to their system. Um, the Cameron Peak fire costs about $130 million to fight. You know, the Cameron Peak fire alone um, after is, is over $100 million and counting in terms of the restoration that's really needed to move forward. You know, it costs about um, $1,200 or so to do, you know, um, thinning projects, um, proactive forest management on the front end. And that's just kind of an average. You know, when you bring in, I'm looking at my fire friends in the back room, you know, Sam and Ryan, you bring in type one heavies, you know, cranes, you know, that's easily a million dollars a day, you know, for, for big fires. 
but the estimate I've heard, and actually Dan Dallas would probably know this the best, but you know, it's um, I believe about you know fifty to sixty to seventy thousand um, dollars easily uh, an acre to treat. You know, if you bring in all the heavies in. And so, you know, fighting fires is really important and we need all those resources, but I can't stress the importance to put, you know, the, the work on the front end. Uh, the DNR is involved with the front end before fires and then after fires. We're not involved, you know, during the fires. But um, anyways, let me just turn it over to, to Matt now. But, you know, really quick, just a few takeaways. Um, you know, forest health collaboratives, in my opinion, work. Uh, it, it really minimizes you know, potential, you know, lawsuits and making sure that you can kind of grease the wheels to get projects off the ground. Um, everyone, all the different players and communities need to have a seat at the table. Um, you know, I think we need to have forest, forest management that looks through a lens similar to what we're trying to do with, I would say kind of fire in general, is a look through a lens of pretending in Colorado, there's no difference between federal, state, private, or tribal lands, that we all work together. And it's kind of like, you know, hey, let's, it doesn't matter if this boundary stops and that boundary stops. Um, I worked on a prescribed fire in Vail last uh, spring uh, with the Vail fire, fire Department. And literally, like, it was, it was great. It was all along the kind of East Vail hillside. Some of you have probably went, went by at that time. But I was asking Vail Fire, you know, why can't we go a little bit farther that way? Well, that's U.S. Forest Service land. We can't do it right there, you know. But like, hey, we had the right team out there to do that. But does that really make sense? So let's all work together. And the shared stewardship MOU, in my opinion, is that great connector with the State Forest Service with Matt, with Frank Mem. Uh, we're also, the state's also having conversations with the Bureau of Land Management so that we can also just like, again, not look at these silos, but all work together uh, to make sure we get the right place, right location, right scale, and all be on the same page. will we'll help create this change of paradigm that I think we're all looking for. So with that, let me just turn it over to, to Matt. Thanks, Dan. Uh, you know, I just want to do a little bit of framing before we get into the dialogue. And you know, having worked in, in at the implementation level across this country, you know, my first job with the US Forest Service was on the Olympic National Forest in the Pacific Northwest. It was the epicenter of the beginning uh, of sort of what has been colloquially known internally and, and as well as externally in the US Forest Service is the timber wars. And I remember my first district ranger telling me that don't go into that bar, don't go into that restaurant, and don't use that gas station, especially if you're in uniform. And, it, and that was the, my, my first introduction, really, as a land management professional into this, this space where, um, where forest management exists with, with a lot of tension, acknowledging that there's just a variety of perspectives on the art and science of, of, uh, of forestry. And even though uh, the, the United States has a remarkable, and states all across the country have a remarkable history of applying forest management in sensible ways that have allowed us to persist uh, for, for generations, the unique uh, ecosystem benefits, quality of life benefits, and, and scenic benefits that, that come from a well-managed forest. We have examples of where um, you know, forestry was practiced unsustainably in, in the late 19th century. And it was the origin story of the US Forest Service. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that the, uh, the um, architect, uh, you know, the, the founder, really the first chief of the US Forest Service, uh, Gifford Pinchot, that his family uh, made their fortune by denuding the Poconos, essentially, like, you know, raping and pillaging the land and leaving it uh, uh, in, in a state of complete disrepair and, 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 and completely, um, undermine economic function. And yet he went over to Germany and then came back uh, and it began experimenting uh, with this new modern approach to forest management and, and essentially established the cradle of forestry in America, which is in North Carolina, which was a place I got to work for about four and a half years as well. And in, in each iteration in, in my career uh, as a land manager, I continued to sort of expose my, uh, get, get exposed to the history and as well as the challenges associated with forestry uh, in the United States. And certainly, and we, we, we come to here uh, to Colorado, we still, it, we have to acknowledge that that tension exists. And one of the things uh, that I've been very focused on throughout my career is flipping this paradigm and trying to face down that tension uh, and those challenges um, in a way that's, that's going to transform the way that people look at log trucks rolling down the road. You know, my, my aspiration, frankly, my, my, my dream is that every single time 
uh, and a successful forest management action takes place in this state. And those, and those trucks are rolling to the mill, generating economic benefits for communities um, and sustaining the unique uh, affiliation that this country and this state has with the practice of forestry, that they also see habitat renewal. They also see watershed health improvement and that folks see um, resilience to climate change and the pressures of, of, uh, of a growing population. I think the most important thing that we can do is it much to the way that uh, Dan was describing is we've got to go meet people where they are. You know, those collaborative settings that that collaborative management model, which really is, is I would say in the last four or five, 10 years has come into a, a state of fruition where, where everybody kind of understands and embraces stakeholder driven solution building and, st uh, and then also embraces um, stakeholder driven and collaborative implementation. You know, that, that, in my experience, again, if you can go to people where they are, where their values lie, where their perspectives are shaped and, and create uh, an environment where we can tease out the tension associated with the legacy of, of logging and, and forest management uh, in this country and in this state, we have a huge opportunity to activate in people's minds um, the uniqueness and, and the incredible efficacy and impact of this amazing tool, which is the, 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 the elegant, in my mind, frankly, this, this beautiful, elegant art and science of, of growing forests uh, into a healthy state that, that allows them to provide the unique benefits that they do uh, to the people and as well as um, our wild neighbors. And, and I think that, uh, I hope that this conversation starts to tease out opportunities where we can continue to lean into that tension and, and acknowledge that we all come from, from different places in our experiences and, and in the places uh, where we work and, and the individuals that we interact with. But we can all agree that uh, we want healthier, more resilient forests in the face of climate change and rapidly growing populations. That we have a, a duty, a responsibility, a moral imperative to ensure that the water continues to flow uh, and, and, that, and that we have the resources that we need for a continually growing nation. And that we don't outsource the impacts to other countries, to other places uh, where where uh, there is less regulation and less environmental review. You know, we, we, we uh, import um, billions of dollars of timber from all across the planet uh, at, in, in places where it's harvested in unsustainable ways, in places where um, we don't have the same influence over the impacts associated with the incredibly important uh, resource that is, that is wood fiber in our economy. So, and I just want one more thing I just want to kind of put into the room as we continue to think about how do we flip the paradigm associated with the legacy and the inherent tensions of forest management in this country. And I'll speak to a hearing that was held last week. And it's only because I think it's fascinating because of the, the voice that's in the room. It's a beautiful voice. It's a world renowned voice. And it's the voice of Carol King, the singer, right? Um, and she was on the Hill last week testifying about the infrastructure bill. And, and use a terminology that I'd never heard before as it relates to how people describe and think of forest management in this country. And um, I gotta tell you, I got a little fired up. I had a little bit of umbrage after this and I no longer work for the US Forest Service, but by God, I sure love the US Forest Service and the work that they do on behalf of the American people. Uh, and the term that, that came out of a bunch of articles in, in this discussion was the, our tendency to use Orwellian euphemisms describe forest management in this country, vegetation management, forest management, uh, restoring resiliency, restoration, Orwellian euphemisms. What that six signals to me is number one, that they're questioning the integrity of, of my colleagues and the, and the integrity of the foresters in this country. And as your state forester, I believe you pay me to take umbrage with those statements. Um, because I'm proud of the forest legacy in this state and I'm proud of the forestry legacy in this country. And, I, and it, it signals to me that we have work to do as it relates to the, fulfilling this dream that I have of how people see forest management uh, in the state. But it also calls into question, are we being successful in the words that we use? Are we being su in successful in describing the remarkable impacts that we can achieve with this remarkable tool that we've been cultivating and growing uh, in, its, in its scientific relevance and groundedness, uh, as well as its efficacy in, in the field as it relates to the new technologies that we have available to deploy. So we have work to do, and I look forward to the conversation about what is that unique work that, that Club 20 and, and community leaders across the state can have in demystifying and destigmatizing in ways uh, that, that people still cling to. And I, you know, if you work for the US Forest Service long enough, you come in contact with this concept of the Lorax effect. 
right? This idea that when anyone sees a tree come down, all they can think of is the thwacker, right? And, the, and this, this hungry animal, this beast trying to, to rob and, and pillage. And I think that that, that, uh, that still obviously exists if, if we can still see in the narratives uh, going up in, uh, with people that have very important roles as, uh, as, as you know, as, I have no idea how famous Carol King is anymore, but I do know that most people know who she is and, and that her, she's pretty famous. She's got a fabulous voice and, uh, and, and a long relationship really with the U.S. Forest Service. And, and the idea that this is sort of where we're at uh, causes me some concern and suggests that we have some work to do as it relates to what it is that we're trying to achieve for the forest. We are so uh, remarkably uh, humbled and honored to manage on behalf of both the state of Colorado but of course, beyond that, the American people, because I don't see those boundaries either. Uh, I, I, I see these forests are Colorado's forests, regardless of the jurisdiction. And we all have a responsibility as Colorado's leaders to manage them effectively. And that requires using forest management uh, as, as a tool in, the, in that toolbox. So I look forward to that conversation. I just want to sort of tee up and then make sure that we're going to embrace and engage that tension associated with the legacy of logging in this country and in this state and, and have some really interesting conversations around how do we move forward uh, in a way that allows the people of Colorado in particular to see this remarkable uh, practice, the rem this remarkable science uh, that, my, that my foresters practice on a daily basis, basis in, in, the, in the consulting foresters and the foresters in the US Forest Service and across all the different agencies that employ those remarkably capable people that have a deep and abiding love for trees. Uh, how we can honor them in a way that, that allows us to take take things to the next level, have the impacts that we know are necessary to deliver clean water, to provide a reliable flow of timber, and to provide uh, the remarkable recreation economy that drives in many ways uh, the economy of this state. Uh, and, and most importantly, I think, um, continue to provide uh, homes for, for our wild neighbors. I think these are, these are the things I, I hope we get into uh, this afternoon. And um, I look forward to the first question. Okay, we've got about 15 minutes uh, for questions. I would encourage everybody that wants to ask questions to keep them short and to the point so that we can get around the room. So Deborah is up and then we'll just follow the. Hi, I'm Deborah Irvin uh, from Breckenridge and I'm proud to be on the board of directors for Club 20. Um, uh, I have been voicing this frustration for many years and so i'm hoping that you will listen matt uh no pressure but to get a little background i live at about eleven thousand feet uh, on two and a half acres and i've been there for 18 years full time we are my community is has um, we're part of the designated firewise community very few in summit county and we're very proud of that every year. Last year, I had 14 piles that I gathered up as a widow uh, for the chipping program. And this year, I'm going to be concentrating on juniper. Our frustration is um, we keep talking about collaboration. But in Summit County, we have about 31,000 uh, residents. On any given powerful weekend, we can have over 200,000 people. And, there, and so we have a majority of tourists. There was, when we had the Peak 2 fire in 2017, there was a fire half a mile behind my house on that was an illegal um, abandoned campfire that by trespassers on basically on Bald Mountain. And that year I spoke with uh, one of the deputies and they said there were over 80 um, abandoned wildfire, uh, campfires that they found. So there were plenty that were, were, went undiscovered. Last, um, in summer of last year, a friend of mine approached me in, at the post office and he said, Deborah, I just wanted you to know, friends of ours, they were up on Bald Mountain, they were looking down. This was during a period where you couldn't even smoke outside. And he said they counted over 40 campfires down below, which were, so they were technically above my house. The attitude that I've gotten from a lot of legislators and some um, local officials is that when I talk, I said, look, we have got to start talking to these tourists and telling them that they have a responsibility. And the answer that I have gotten is we do not want to offend the tourists. And of course, my response is, wait, what? And 
that and that's where we've stayed. And I have been doing this for years and complaining. So, you know, again, no pressure. Um, but how can we get to a program that is not a, a literally two inches by one inch that's in the tourism manual that they give people that says you need to put out fires. If you have a campfire, put it out with water. I will tell you that in Bald Mountain, not everybody's drinking water up there and what they're putting on fires, I would not want to put on fires. So what can we do to talk about collaboration? We have got to hold tourists responsible and then accountable for what's going on. We have to take a drone to go flying around and some 35 year old in their mother's basement can be flying this thing to tell us and give us coordinates where we have campfires going on. I know it was too long, but thank you so much. I look forward to that much. program. Uh, I want to deploy the basement uh, squadron for fire mitigation. So real quick on that one. So man, what a, so one of my favorite things to do is fire patrol, right? When I was a district ranger on the, in the districts I worked across, uh, across the country, when we're in higher fire danger, everyone goes to task and goes out and, and does everything they can to reach as many people as they can to, to deliver that message in a one-on-one -on -one basis. And it was remarkable, you know, how many folks uh, don't see that as a as a as a concern, and, and you know Dan could tell you how many uh, Dallas, our 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 resident uh, incident commander here today, um, could tell us specifically how many fires he has worked in in his career that were human uh, started. So one thing that I would offer is that you know we take um, every opportunity that we can as an outreach agency to reach folks um, with as much messaging and as and much uh, you know promotional material as we can around using fire safely. The US Forest Service has an enormous campaign associated with you know, Smokey Bear and a variety of other um, you know, mascots and, 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 and outreach campaigns. But I'll tell you one good indicator of that the, the, the legislators are listening is that there's a bill in the, in the legislature right now that's designed to significantly amplify Wildfire Awareness Month in May every year. The, the state signed on and, and has ramped up its education every single year. I got to give all credit to Governor Polis and, and for Director Gibbs to, to foot stomping and, and providing backing uh, to that message in, in creating as many opportunities as we can to get it out. And, and if this bill passed, the Colorado State Forest Service will have a significant investment like we haven't really seen before that's specifically to design to ensure that folks are not only aware of how to uh, create defensible space, how to harden their homes, how to be part of the solution as it relates to, uh, to uh, creating uh, every opportunity for, the, for their communities to remain safe in the face of wildfire, but also using fire, uh, both for you know, recreational purposes and otherwise, um, in a safe and, 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 and an effective way where they're taking the personal responsibility associated with, uh, with using fire on the landscape uh, for recreational purposes. Uh, but as far as, you know, it's, it's an extremely challenging um, issue, especially with visitors, because they kind of have a, uh, well, that was fun. I'm packing up and now I'm leaving uh, approach to things. And whatever happens after I've left um, is really not my problem. Creating that buy-in um, is, is a thing that I think community by community, if you can make that a community value, I used to say like in the Gunnison Basin, let's make them understand this is what the cool kids do, right? You wanna be cool like us here in Gunnison, Crested Butte, then put your fire out when you're done and, and be part of the solution, not part of the problem. But there are some good indicators that the legislature's hearing your concerns and interested in amplifying our message uh, that we carry on every single year. Um, and so I'm hopeful that that, that that bill will pass and we'll be able to foot stomp in ways that we haven't in the past and amplify in ways we haven't in the past wildfire awareness uh, and, and helping every individual resident and visitor um, learn how to play their part. And I'll just add, I, I share your, your frustration and concerns because, you know, you remember after the peak two fire, uh, literally I heard from red, white, and blue, um, like, hey, there's 15 other, you know, unattended campfires going on at the same time while we had stage two fire restrictions in the county. So that means like, no, no, nothing flammable, you know, should be going on. I, I think, I think the state, frankly, I, I think it's a combination of like, um, everything from like, you know, chambers of commerce coming together, the governor, the governments, the county and the municipalities. Um, and, and also, you know, as you know, in Summit County, they're having a lot of discussions on, you know, enhanced like short term rental um, regulations and so forth. You, you could make it a requirement that you know, uh, you know, because short term rentals are kind of like a hotel, right? You know, you, you make sure there's information on the front end, like, hey, make sure you follow local fire 
uh, ordinances, you know, and, and if you don't, these are the penalties. I also think CDOT can, can play more of an important role too with their, all their variable message signs, all the people that come up to resort areas and not just say, you know, whatever, Clear Creek and, or Jefferson, Clear Creek and Summit and Eagle or whatever are stage one fire restrictions. Like no one knows what that means, you know, but, but say, you know, fire ban and then whatever X amount of money penalties, you know, to make sure people know on the front end um, that this is serious. Um, and it's just uh, not, not something that we should tolerate at all. So, but I share your concerns 100%. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Molly Pitts, and I serve as the executive director for the Colorado Timber Industry Association. And I have more of a comment than a question, but I participate um, in the best management practices audit team. And it's something that happens every two years. We visit state, federal, and private lands. And our audits show that we're doing really good work on the ground. But it, nobody besides me and some other state forest service people know what that is. And I, I think that message needs to get out. Um, I think that's one of the biggest concerns with public is that we're out raping and pillaging and um, we do really good work on the ground. And so I would really like you guys to help get that message out. We do it to protect water quality. Um, and it shows, you can go back the last 12 years, I think now, and show that we are doing really good work. And it doesn't matter what um, boundary, you know, whether it's state, private or federal, the work we are doing out there is really good. And so I think that would be a good thing to get out to the public more. Thanks, Molly. Uh, Dan and Matt, thank you for being here and thank you for your expertise. My name is Lewis Meyer and currently I'm a rancher, farmer, uh, in Southwest Colorado, in Montezuma County, and La Plata County. Uh, prior to that, um, I was a water engineer for 40 years, founder of Schmieser Gordon Meyer SGM Inc. Um, the last six years on our ranch uh, has been uh, apocalyptic to say the least. Um, fires on all sides of us, um, heavy, thick smoke to the point you can't even be outside safely in the summertime. Um, high winds, which by the way, I think is something that needs to be considered. Um, in 2021, Montezuma County had no water, no irrigation water. The large federal project, Jackson Reservoir, zero water for agricultural irrigation. Smaller reservoirs, zero water. My question is, uh, earlier today in the presentations, there was a statement made multiple times about let's follow the best science. What is, what is the science informing us? Uh, and then proceeded to be a lot of conversation about fuels mitigation, uh, fuel reduction. Later on, we had a discussion about climate resiliency. The question I have is what are your experts telling you about what is driving these fires? Uh, because the engineer, the scientist in me would like to know uh, the solutions we bring form, forward need to be informed by the science and what percentage is driving these issues. Uh, uh, thank you. Sure. So, um, you know, one of the benefits of being uh, nested at the Colorado State University is that we have access to the entirety of, of the research body, not only uh, housed within the university, but the co-located Rocky Mountain Research Station as well, which is an, uh, uh, part of the U.S. Forest Service. And so there are a variety of factors that are, that are driving sort of large wildfires across Colorado. In the, the, I don't know if the, I can't speak specifically the percentages, but um, the, I try to keep things relatively simple when we, when we try to explain these to, to, to citizens across the state. Number one is, the, the number one thing that's driving uh, wildfires is the absence of wildfire. And, and it, it, you know, Dan showed a picture at the very beginning of his presentation that showed what a healthy forest looked like. 
And a healthy forest is a patchy forest with multiple different age classes represented, multiple different species represented, um, and, and is consistently exposed to disturbances that create a patchwork, of, a patchwork landscape that allows fires to move through at low intensity. And um, right now we have a whole, we have a state that's, that needs to be desensitized to this idea that a unbroken forest of single, uh, in single age, uh, uh, in single species trees is a healthy forest. And that we have to help folks understand that um, a wealth of data and a wealth of scientific research demonstrates that a healthy forest is uh, what I just described uh, before. And, th and that one of the best ways for us to move uh, our forest back into that, to that uh, condition is forest management. And probably the most, uh, but, but the most efficient tool and the, and the least, well, potentially the least cost tool is to before, uh, restore fire to those landscapes. And one of the things that uh, I'm super focused on is as we move out with these sub substantial investments across uh, both the state and, and federal levels is um, focusing on securing communities first and focusing on securing infrastructure first, prioritizing uh, where that uh, values at risk, those, those specific uh, pieces of infrastructure, uh, people's homes, uh, transmission lines, uh, uh, water transmission infrastructure, you know, what, whatever the value is that we've been identified is that that's where we put our money and our time first, because that creates an opportunity for the US forest and other fire uh, managers that when fires start uh, in the backcountry uh, through natural ignition, gives us an opportunity to kind of contemplate um, managing them in different ways, allowing them in the right conditions to help us restore that patchy network, that broken network of different age classes, different species uh, that allows for fire to restore itself in, in the natural role. The science is telling us that that is the, that is the outcome. If you wanna think about um, what you want things to look like going forward, uh, again, if you're, that's, that's what it should look like, uh, a broken multi-age class forest with a, a variety of species that allows fire when it presents to move through in a way that's not catastrophic, but um, ecologically supportive and, and ecologically affirming. And so um, there is a robust body uh, of, of research and science that suggests this is the path that we should be taking and that ecosystem driven forestry is, is the, one of the key mechanisms uh, to achieve those outcomes in that, in that future. I think we got time for one quick question. As I already told, we were almost out of time. Great, thank you. I'm April Long. I um, work in the Roaring Fork watershed. I really appreciate your comment because I was asked, was hoping to ask a question about this paradigm shift um, where we have seen um, forest forestation or deforestation happen so badly for so many years and, and lots of um, naysayers can point to examples of how it's been done so poorly and it would be great to have examples of how it's been done well um, because I think the fear is that the consequence of not doing it well is so takes so long to recover from um, and so I'm happy to hear that and I'm just going to switch up my que question really quickly to um, do you have any numbers or or can point to anything about the greenhouse gas emissions from a prescribed burn versus the logging of that same forested, forested area. Um, so for those that are concerned about that carbon emission. Yes, yeah, so carbon accounting, mm -hmm. a evolving science. And, you know, so even right now uh, in, in, this, in this session, you know, we're in, in conversations with legislators with an intense focus. We, we're in conversations with partners uh, in TNC and elsewhere that are very interested in how are we going to effectively quantify uh, these trade-offs in, in, in the treatments and the approaches that we take? And how are we going to be accountable to, this, uh, to the knowledge uh, th that we all now share about uh, what's driving our warming climate? And so we're not there yet. And, and, but the good news is that literally w about three weeks ago, we engaged in some dialogue uh, with the Colorado Forest Restoration Institute, CFRI at CSU, to commission an, um, uh, a study through a, a coalition of masters and doctoral students as well as supported by CFRI to begin to develop that accounting framework that's going to allow us to quantify the carbon release and the carbon capture associated with forest management so that we can be uh, transparent and responsive to the, to the 
very real and, uh, and legitimate concerns that folks have as it relates to the trade-off associated with management versus, um, versus uh, either prescribed or, or wildland fire. So we're, it's a work in progress. We don't have the data yet, but the good thing is that we're moving in that direction right now. And there's even uh, some discussions again in the legislature to significantly increase the capacity within the state forest service to, uh, to be able to have a um, accessible, what, I'm, what I mean by accessible, like you don't have to have a PhD to understand, accessible body of knowledge and science that we can share with the people of Colorado to continue to build the confidence and the faith that they have and the activities that we conduct on their behalf. So feel free to support that endeavor any way you'd like. Okay, we're giving them again, please. This well, I know there was other questions in the room and I'm sorry you didn't have time to ask them, but you guys will be around for a while and maybe you, you could approach We could do them. it at the reception. At the reception. With a glass in hand. All right, glass in hand, all right, thank you. I think that one goes in there.
Our next breakout session will begin in five minutes.
Please take your seats as we begin our next breakout session. All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Andrew Johnson. I'm the, the forest supervisor on the Bighorn National Forest up in uh, North Central Wyoming. And I just was telling Matt that he and Dan are a really tough act to follow and I'll, I'll give it a try. So um, if you don't know where the uh, Bighorn National Forest is, it's in North Central Wyoming. We're about 1.1 million acres. And uh, it's a you know, distinct chain separate from the rest of the Rocky Mountains and part of the Rocky Mountains. We're a little bit of a geologic uh, oddity, um, but while remote, we're not isolated from the same issues that we've spent a lot of time talking about today. Um, so I'm going to talk about two projects that we've had going for the last few years um, that are really targeted towards enhancing water quality and protecting municipal watersheds. Um, and uh, first, let me give you a caveat. I'm not a silviculturist, not a hydrologist, not even a forester. Um, so I might not be able to answer some you know, technical hydro questions or things like that. But what I can do is talk to you about what, what worked about these projects and what lessons we had, what we learned um, as we worked through these um, to try to get some, some good work done on the landscape. So on the map on the right, there's two blobs on that map. The Northern one, that's the municipal watershed for the city of Sheridan, Wyoming. And the one down below is the watershed for the city of Buffalo, Wyoming. So the, uh, I'm biased, I like it up there, but the Bighorn is pretty beautiful, pretty phenomenal landscape. Um, perhaps our isolation helped us avoid the widespread impacts of the mountain pied beetle epidemic. It really didn't hit the big form, Bighorn. Whether that was a factor of our isolation, a factor of unique genetics in Lodgepole or, or uh, Ponderosa on the forest, uh, who knows? But the fact of the matter is we were largely spared from the pine beetle epidemic. So the forest is still largely green. It's a lodgepole dominant ecosystem, but interspersed with lots of large meadow systems uh, and wet meadow systems that, that generate you know, really good high quality water, which serves our communities. Um, but a key issue to note down there in the bottom is 56% of the forest is an inventoried roadless. And so that was a question that came up earlier this morning that I'll circle back to you a couple times as we talk this afternoon. So, while we have not seen the large scale wildfires that in the examples that were discussed today, fires here in Colorado, um, I was down here for the Grizzly Creek fire and unfortunately got to see some of that firsthand or the large wildfires in California. The, the Bighorn has been largely spared from that sort of fire activity. Though we do have a, a historic fire regime of fires in the 10 to 20,000 acre range as normal. Um, and over the years, those fires have at times impacted our municipal watersheds. What you see up there is the into, oh, I gotta move the slide, there we go. All right, so we, what you see are the uh, intake structures for the city of Buffalo's water supply and the city of Sheridan. Similar looking structures, both of which are on the national forest. Um, and wildfires impacted the city of Buffalo uh, in 78, 88, and 2014. And we're really kind of a wake up call for the city and for us that uh, there was a need for change. Um, we need to figure out what the relative risk of those was, was to those, that infrastructure, those watersheds, so that we didn't end up with scenarios like that, which on the, on the left, that's the Mullen fire from the Medicine Bow Route, and the one on the right is the Crater Ridge fire from on the Bighorn last summer. And so first, the Buffalo Municipal Watershed Project, which we call BMW, it's a lot easier, a little simpler. Um, we initiated that project in 2017, um, and it wasn't really the Forest Service at the, at the forefront. It was a collaboration between the city, uh, Johnson County, the Wyoming Water Development Office and others to take a good hard look at the Clear Creek watershed, which provides the drinking water for a city of around 4,500 people. 95% of that watershed and that water supply is located on National Forest. Um, also in the center of that right here is the Tyhack Reservoir, which is the city of Buffalo's storage reservoir. Um, 38,000 acre project area 
you know, clearly at, at pretty high risk um, of impact. And if you think about, you know, we talk about impacts to the front range, the city of Denver, um, and to those, all those millions of folks as water supply. Think of the, uh, the level of effect it would have for a wildfire to do $100 million worth of damage to a city of 4,500 people's water supply. They simply can't absorb that impact on that, that small of a tax base. So next, the Sheridan Municipal Watershed, again, a little bit further north. These projects were sequential. I'm gonna talk about them kind of together because they are very, very similar. So this one we initiated in 2019. The Sheridan Municipal Watershed is uh, about, serves a community of around 20,000 people, which is really big for Wyoming as Jim Nyman knows, but small for the, the rest of the world. Um, city relies on the Big Goose watershed for its drinking water. So again, also more than 95% of that watershed's on public lands, multiple storage reservoirs across that watershed, which are really uh, important recreation assets to the forest and to the communities. So a little bit bigger project area, again, about 77,000 acres. So initially what our, our approach was is we, we had recognized that there was, there was a problem out there on the landscape and so did the, our municipalities. Um, but we didn't know exactly what specifically that risk was, where it was in the landscape, what timber stands, what soil types, what drainages. And those were questions that we knew in the forest that we couldn't answer alone. Um, so we approached this project collaboratively from the start. Uh, this was not the kind of traditional forest service effort where we decided what the issue was. We created a solution to that problem. And then we said, what do you think? Um, we didn't have the resources of a very small national forest with a small staff to really grasp and do the work that it, do, it would take to really assess what the relative risk was to this watershed and what we needed to do there. So again, these projects were born collaboratively. We got funding from the Wyoming Water Development Office uh, to, uh, and the governor's office to initiate some contracted wildfire hazard risk assessments um, that were, those assessments were guided by the forest, um, the state, uh, Wyoming State Forestry Division, and of course the cities and their municipalities. Um, we did the Buffalo one first and then followed that up with the Sheridan watershed. Um, the goal of those assessments were one, to assess what is the risk, but also come up with a plan for how we could enhance and maintain water quality across those watersheds. So with shared risks, we need to find shared solutions. Um, these are again, small rural communities, a small national forest, limited staff, limited capacity, uh, financially and in human capacity to take on a challenge of this sort of magnitude. So we recognize that need for mutual expertise, relationships and funding and leverage to all those to kind of move this along and, and uh, make some progress. So this is what that, this is an example of what those watershed hazard assessments looked like for us. That map is the, the Sheridan Municipal Watershed one. Um, you can see in the, that mix of color schemes that top corner, the northeast corner of the map, which is the bottom of the drainage, there's where your highest risk relied. Uh, and where the deepest red is um, in the, you can see, I think it's number 206. That's, uh, that's where the city's intake is. Um, steep country, heavily timbered at high, high risk. And those other blobs spread across the landscape down here, 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 here. Those are where the storage reservoirs were, all of them at high risk. Um, and so this is a composite risk matrix by drainage. That's what you're looking at there. So this takes into account forest health conditions, fuel loading, uh, fire behavior modeling, uh, soils and geomorphology data, um, debris flow and sediment delivery potential, um, considers all sorts of, you know, all of those risks. It also takes into account inventory road lists, wilderness, areas of difficult access, and then sediment trade-offs. One of the things that we knew going into this project, thanks to our work with the Water Development Office, was that if we were going to disturb, you know, more than roughly 15% of the landscape with treatments, which might make sense to reduce the risk, that in and of itself would increase sediment delivery, and we'd be, you know, uh, robbing the, or we'd be shooting ourselves in the foot. If we were treating too much of the landscape, we wouldn't be resolving the risk and getting as much done as we needed to. So some examples of uh, the data in there, um, you have, Fire line intensity, crown fire activity, burn severity, all of things that we were using to, to, to get a grasp of what, needed to treat, what we needed to treat, where we needed to treat it, and how. So that led to two separate NEPA decisions. Again, the collaboration didn't end with assessing what that risk was. We continued that pattern. Um, our 
biologists on the uh, interdisciplinary team, for example, were Wyoming Game and Fish employees, not Forest Service. We had one of the ID teams was led by a Wyoming State Forestry employee. Um, we did the, the analysis collaboratively. Each assessment took roughly a year uh, to complete. So we'll talk a little bit about, as I move on, about size and scale. These are relatively small projects, and we talk a lot these days when we talk about the wildfire crisis about increasing the pace and scale. Well, you can increase the pace and scale. It doesn't necessarily mean to have a gigantic project area because that might not be as quick as addressing a risk quickly through a, a targeted assessment, which both of these were. So some examples of the treatments we proposed and have now implemented on the Buffalo watershed and when we start implementation in Sheridan uh, next summer. So the mix of timber harvest and thinning, Jim will be pleased. One of the purpose and need for the project was to generate timber for our local, local timber economy. Um, so we, our target for the, the timber work was really increase that diversity of those stands and, and reduce the density, trying to create some resilience for wild and resistance to wildfire, and also to uh, reduce, continue to resist insect and disease impacts, which we've been successful with so far. So on the Buffalo project, that was about 1,900 acres of harvest strategically placed as a catcher's mitt for fire if it started in the wilderness to come out we put, and, and targeted those stands that were at the highest risk. Um, and uh, 1,200 acres of which were clear cuts. Again, carefully considered, carefully placed to mimic the effects of natural wildfire, reduce the risk of sedimentation, but accomplish our goals. Sheridan Municipal Watershed Project, larger acreage, larger scale. 4,000 acres of timber harvest, 9,000 acres of thinning. So of course, with that thinning, you need to, we need to burn. Um, on the BMW project, that was up to 3,000 acres of thinning and burning. Um, the photo there on the right um, is a good example of how we approach this work. We rarely get good burn windows on the Bighorn. Often when we have the right conditions where the stands we need to treat are gonna be receptive to fire, they're a little too receptive and the neighboring stands are as well. And so we often, we have had traditionally pretty narrow idea of what a burn window looked like. Through this project, we took a different approach to that. We matched timber and thinning units with, with burn units in it and did them sequentially. Um, so to reduce the risk of a fire escaping from the stands we couldn't treat with timber that we wanted to treat with fire, we treated them with timber around those, timber harvest around them. Um, we also targeted south facing slopes with uh, lower canopy covers, more open country where we could manage the intensity of fire so that we knew we couldn't burn the north facing slopes because the intensities would be too high. Well, we'll reduce the risk of fire getting there by treating the other side. We also wrote our prescriptions differently so we would have more flexibility on time of year. The burn on the right was that was December. We've had a very low snow year on the Bighorn uh, with those broad broadly written prescribed fire prescriptions, we were able to treat the, some units by drone, drone, uh, um, drone based ignition in mid-December before we had too much snow on the landscape, but when we had just enough on the north facing slopes, we didn't need to prep any of those units. Similar approach in the Sheridan Municipal Watershed, just without the fire component, and I'll talk about why shortly, but 9,000 acres of thinning up there, an extensive thinning, almost all of that 9,000 acres of thinning was in inventoried roadless. So another key component of this work is of course enhancing water quality and reducing sedimentation. Um, we've approached that a couple different ways. Again, in partnership with, uh, with those key players who helped us to, to you know, craft this work. Um, and that's the Wyoming Game and Fish Department and, out, and our Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. So what you see behind you, those are beaver dam analogs. We needed ways to get, to slow water down as it moved across the landscape to catch sediment if we had sedimentation increase from wildfires. And so on a number of locations in both project areas, we're building beaver dam analogs, largely with volunteers, community volunteers doing that work, um, RMEF funded. Um, we also did a significant amount of aspen restoration work. That would be entering those aspen stands to reduce conifer encroachment um, and use the slash generated by that to uh, protect the young aspen seedlings from browse from, from wildlife and from cattle. That's been a particularly successful component so far. So we get to the roadless piece. This is where you know this work gets difficult. With uh, an example on the Sheridan Municipal Watershed Project, 63% of that project area is an inventory roadless. That's 48,900 acres of that project area, but we are still able to treat about 9,000 acres, and that's through really maximizing our use of the exemptions that exist in the roadless rule, 
Unlike Colorado, Wyoming does not have a state roadless rule. So we operate under the National Roadless Area Conservation Rule. Um, so we look to maximize the use of those exemptions, which allow us to do timber harvest and, and more importantly, a lot of mechanical thinning when that action is a benefit and it improves and it protects roadless characteristics. And one way to think about that is if we did not act in those 9,000 acres of roadless, the likely outcome would be a wildfire that removed that, that canopy cover, destroyed those, those stands, reduced the ability to that, that landscape to, to uh, provide high quality drinking water for the communities. And really the whole purpose of those being protected as roadless would be gone. Um, so we maximize the use of those exemptions. We use a lot of mechanical thinning, but also straight timber harvest, 300 acres of that, um, 500 acres aspen rest restoration and, and beyond. Um, but we can't target all of it. We, it's, you know, while the challenge of treating and roadless exists, we use the exemptions to the best of our ability, but we still have some residual risk left on the landscape. So on the left, that's that same map I showed earlier. That's the composite risk matrix before treatment for the Sheridan Municipal Watershed Project. And on the right is what it will look like post-treatment. Again, we're just starting implementation of that when the decision was signed last year. So you can see the areas around the watersheds and the catchment basins for those reservoirs. We've significantly reduced the risk and hazard to those um, and increased that ability, the ability of that watershed to, uh, to continue to you know, catch sediment um, and uh, be more resilient to wildfire. We've done the best we can in this north east part of the project area. There we have probably the, the most of the roadless is there. It's also really kind of steep terrain, particularly where the city's intake is. But again, we've reduced the risk overall pretty significantly. And then the follow on treatment to that, which we're analyzing now is, is more use of prescribed fire across that landscape. Um, and you know, why did we separate out that in, the, in that decision? That's again, about increasing that pace and scale. We knew that the relative risk across those stands was high. The prescribed fire treatments we need to use in these stands are not like the ones in that Buffalo project, which were largely burning sagebrush or sparsely uh, timbered south facing slopes, relatively small burns, thousand acres or so at a time. The burns that we need to perform on the Sheridan watershed are much larger, two, three, four, five, ten thousand 10,000 acres at a time in dense lodgepole stands. It's the kind of fire that's of an intensity that our communities haven't seen before. Um, it's also the kind that is hard to manage and capture. So we needed to take a more deliberate and, and careful approach to planning that work. So rather than bog down the Sheridan Municipal Watershed analysis by including the prescribed fire, we moved quickly, authorized the, the timber and the thinning and the aspen restoration work, got that decision done in less than a year and are moving to implement it while we do the harder work, which is planting burns in that complex landscape, which in time will, oop, wrong button, in time, will resolve some of this lingering risk, particularly in the north, north part of the project. And so, you know, lastly, what are those, what are those lessons learned? Um, for us, it's that we need to, the diversity of a project area, the diversity of a challenge directly relates to the diversity of the team you need to assemble to address it. Um, and for us, that was bringing as many partners as we could to the table to, to fill in the gaps in our skill set and our knowledge base. Um, and uh, so we, we scale up those interagency and com community partnerships are absolutely critical. Um, and and those, those partnerships need to come from the start, from before we get to the NEPA analysis. It's from the assessing what the actual risk and challenges on the landscape start there. Um, and then, you know, leverage each one of those individual partners' uh, skills and, and what they bring to the table. For the Wyoming Water Development Office, that was money that could fund those hazard assessments that we were unable to do. Um, for, you know, the uh, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation is funding some of the non-traditional work like building beaver dam analogs. Uh, um, and then we also have used the NRCS Forest Service Joint Chiefs Program to fund most of the implementation of the Buffalo Municipal Watershed. Again, something we would not be able to do without those partners at the table. Um, and then we have to make those hard trade-offs about, could we treat all of the roadless? We couldn't, but we could treat enough of it that would make a meaningful difference and only leave a small amount of residual risk on the landscape. Um, and then trying to balance that need to not treat all of the acres that we potentially could have, because that in and of itself would increase that risk of sedimentation that we were trying to avoid. Um, and then continue to work through those challenges of, of roadless. So again, two relatively small projects, but projects that were really targeted towards a critical need on the landscape um, and that were done quickly and effectively, I think. There you go. Questions? Yes.
Yeah. Thank you. That was a really, really great presentation. Um, so I'm Christina Burry with Denver Water. Um, for those conversations, when, when you're thinking about the three steps, the risk assessment, then the prioritization, and then the mapping, for that mapping exercise, talking about um, what's accessible, what's not, what's steep, who on the National Forest is part of those conversations? And the reason I ask is, is it, did you use pods? Did you bring in the fire folks? Did you bring in the hydrologist? Did you bring in the timber manager? Were they all in the same room? And how do those conversations happen? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So did, first about pods, did we use pods? No, this was before the, the pods conversation reached the Bighorn. We're doing that work now. Um, but so who, who was in the room? I would say it wasn't just the Forest Service. It was, um, you know, yes, our fire and fuels folks. Yes, our timber folks, wildlife in particular. Um, a lot of these treatments are also something I didn't mention, targeted around ensuring that we retain enough elk security habitat. Um, uh, and then our partners, the key partners that have that expertise. So hydrologists from the Wyoming Water Development Office, um, partners in game and fish, partners in, in, um, in state forestry. Because um, how we've implemented these is the whole suite of tools that other, other folks have mentioned today. It's good neighbor authority. Um, it's state timber sales, our own timber sales. But so in those initial risk trade-off conversations, it is that the bigger group um, from the different partners. So where we can, you know, where the fire and fuels folks from the Forest Service might target wanting to treat certain stands, but those, those trade off, the trade are going to be trade offs to wildlife habitat that game and fish is bringing up to sediment risk that uh, um, our hydrologists are bringing up. So it's, it's the mix. And from the beginning, at the table from the start, not us going to them with a proposal, we developed the proposal together. This might be a hard one to answer, but I really liked about the information you brought about the Wyoming Water Development Funded Hazard Assessments. Do you know what one of those would have cost or since they put up the funds? In Colorado, we see Forest of Faucets, we have our big water providers put up the 33 million when it goes water to Trans Mountain Diversion. And in the Western Slope, we're much more like Wyoming meaning our little municipal water providers don't have deep pockets to do that. So I'd love to find a department in Colorado, part state level, that would help fund some of those risk assessments. I talked to Jamie with our wildfire local regional guys, they don't have the capacity. So it's finding that gap that we're missing, I think on the Western Slope was my first question and I've already forgotten my second question. So that's enough for me. Well, if you, you, I'll answer the first one while you think about what the second one was. So if I recall, they were roughly around a half million or um, yeah, half million dollars each, about 500,000. Um, on the first, that funding was exclusively from the Wyoming Water Development Office with the support of the governor's office. On the second one, the state legislature didn't allocate those funds. And so it was funded by a mix of existing funds the Wyoming Water Development Office already had, and then funds from us and from Sheridan County. Um, but both were roughly around 500,000. And like I said, they were contracted out. They were done by the Anchor Point Group from here in Colorado in Boulder, um, uh, Respect, which is a company in Missoula, and HDR out of Rapid City, South Dakota, each one bringing a certain skill set to the table. But Anchor Point was the prime contractor for those. And, you know, one thing that's important to, to me and some of you probably recognize is that uh, contracting with the Forest Service is not an easy thing to do for us. It's painful, it's long, it's expensive. It doesn't make sense for us to award that contract. It makes sense for the state to do that. Um, so we provide the funds, our share of the funds into an agreement and those contracts are advertised and awarded by the state of Wyoming. We're doing the exact same thing right now on a forest wide integrated weed management EIS that's being, it's funded by uh, or, or a contract with a third party contractor awarded by the Wyoming Department of Agriculture. Um, hi, Cindy Dozier, uh, Executive Committee Club 20. Um, 
I, you win the award for the fastest talking, <laughs> most intense information sending out um, person I have seen today. Uh, I, I feel I like I just I just got blasted with a fire hose from you. So much good information. I'm a New Yorker. I apologize. <laughs> um, my question involves something that we experience here in Colorado, and perhaps where you are, it's a little bit different. And that is, how do you achieve? public support slash social license to do a, I think you said a 10,000 acre prescribed burn, didn't you say that? We're looking to, yeah. And how did you achieve social license to do that? That's, that's impressive. Yeah, so social license can be a tricky thing. Um, it, it's, uh, when you have it, it's great, but it's easy to lose. Um, it, you know, and it's, it's something that in my opinion is based on trust and it's based on past experience. It's also based on fear. Um, and so we have, you know, one of the things that when I came to the Bighorn roughly five years ago, um, impressed me immediately is how strong of relationships the forest had with its counties in particular, with the county commissions. Um, you know, the forest is, is uh, spread across four counties, Sheridan Johnson on the, on the east side, Bighorn and Washakie counties in the west, and all four of those uh, sets of county commissioners worked very, very closely with the forest and were good supporters of the work we have going on, um, and that's based on continuous engagement um, with each other, um, and so we have used and leveraged that relationship to build social license or support in the communities for the work that we need to do, even when that work isn't necessarily what uh, people in the communities are comfortable with or necessarily even happy about. Um, if we are communicating that need in lockstep with our counties, with state forestry, with game and fish, and with some of our you know, local partners like the local chapter of RMEF or backcountry hunters and anglers, groups like that, we find that we're more successful. Um, these are communities too that are very comfortable and supportive of timber harvest in general. Um, they recognize its value. They recognize what it, it does uh, what, with the value of that as a tool to manage the landscape. Um, so we, we experience support for that. However, these are, these are communities that are wary of wildfire. You know, like I mentioned, the Bighorn doesn't see a lot of wildfire. You know, average fire size is 10 to 12,000 acres. So smoke in the sky can be concerning for folks but we have a good track record of success with those burns. But again, the, that circling back to that reason why the Sheridan Municipal Watershed decision didn't include prescribed fire is because those burns are complicated. Those burns are big and they're not something our communities, I would say are ready for. So that's, we're taking a little bit more time. So that, that decision was more intensive on the mechanical treatments um, to, to reduce risk now while we do the harder work. Um, and so we are actively, engaging with our communities and sort of publicizing the recent successes we've had with prescribed fire, as well as one of the photos up there was of the Crater Ridge wildfire that, that burned on the forest, the north part of the forest for two months this summer, um, but burned for two months without generating any risk to private lands, um, didn't destroy any privately owned structures. structures. It burned down a, a, an old cabin of ours that that was a good thing that it went away. It was a rat infested dump. Um, so it solved a problem in my, my mind. Um, but we also, you know, kind of leveraged living with the smoke from that fire and the benefits that that was having on the landscape as part of this conversation. About So we, we, you know, we know that there is concern, there's risk, but there's also positive benefits that come out of it. Um, Game and Fish is mirroring that, that one of their talking points around the Crater Ridge wildfire was how excited they were for the beneficial habitat effects for elk. Um, and that those those units would be good ones to put in a tag for it. If you want to know what they are, I'll tell you later. Okay. We're going to go one, two, three. I'm going to let Chris. Thanks, Ray. Andrew, uh, echo others' compliments on your presentation. Really good and even more importantly, encouraging information. Thank you. Um, you, you started out and had a slide that this, the the purpose, the theme was a, an improvement of water quality. That was the, uh, the primary purpose. And I'm wondering, was that uh, improving water quality baseline conditions or improving water or ensuring that water quality wasn't ruined by wildfire? And then uh, 
allied question on the other side of the equation, was water quantity any part of the, the goals and what were the metrics for measuring success for water quality and water quantity? Yeah, that's a great question. I can't remember where, where that was in there, but so yes, one of those primary purposes was to enhance water quality. And I would say, while not named, also to, to improve water quantity um, or at least retain it. And so um, both concepts were, were throughout the planning, on um, people's minds throughout the planning process. Um, and so in that regard, these weren't just about generating timber. They weren't just about reducing fuels. That's why you see the, the, uh, the Aspen enhancement work, the Beaver Dam analog work. And, and, and some of the burns, you know, I didn't mention this moving through it, but some of the prescribed burns that uh, we're doing through, through the Buffalo Municipal Watershed Project aren't targeted at fuels reduction. They're targeted at improving uh, stand conditions in sagebrush. Um, in sage, you know, where we have similar terminology to, to timber stands, we have a lot of acres of sagebrush that it's canopy cover, uh, density and, and diversity of age structure is out of alignment with where it should be. The same sort of conversation we have around timber stands. And so we wanted to use fire to break up the continuity of those sagebrush, uh, those sagebrush, that sagebrush ecosystem, punch some holes in it basically, um, and allow for some more grass and forb development, which you know can benefit our uh, livestock producers. It also benefits wildlife. Um, and so, you know, and at the same time, reduces the risk of those all burning off at the same time in a large wildfire, which would in increase sedimentation and, you know, have challenges for water quality. So, you know, the water quality and water quantity component were intermixed. How specific, what specific actions were included around water quantity? Um, that's a tougher one for me to answer. Like I said, I'm not a hydrologist, though a good part of our focus was treatments around the catchment basins for those storage reservoirs so that should portions of those burn, sedimentation didn't reduce the uh, ability of them to hold to store water um, and sort of kept up the output that the, the landscape generates right now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on the water quantity question, I'm curious, you mentioned that some of the burning happened in lodgepole stands and you avoided north facing slopes. Was any of that because of snowpack capture and retention? Because I'm just curious about the research because the research we're digging into like the, the closest water quantity benefits we're finding are in stand management to influence snowpack management. I wonder if that was part of the planning. The, the snowpack component was about containing the fire with minimal investment in, you know, very steep country. So we can't treat it mechanically. So we can't build fire line, for example, with mechanical fuel break. It would have to be done by hand, which is time consuming and expensive. And so burning the south facing slopes when the north facing slopes have snow on them um, solves that containment problem for us. Okay. Also, just the way that the landscape is laid out in that Buffalo Municipal Watershed area. Um, and as those slopes flow down to their intake point, um, those north, the timber cover on those north facing slopes is pretty integral towards you know, uh, preventing lots of sediment mm -hmm. from flowing into the creeks. Um, and so again, we're targeting those south facing slopes uh, to prevent the likely path of a wildfire based on historic, historic fire, uh, uh, fires on that landscape. Um, the way fire is gonna move with prevailing winds, with fuel loading and alignment, um, those critical slopes to treat are the south facing ones to slow or even stop a fire from spreading onto the north facing slopes, which would have that catastrophic effect. Uh, Wendell Koontz, Delta County Commissioner. Uh, first of all, thanks for recognizing RMEF and, and the volunteers. It's, I'm a member and our dues and our fundraising go to projects just like that. And, and there's a lot of other organizations like uh, Wild Turkey Foundation that put a lot of effort into doing that. So thank you for that. You mentioned a couple of times in your presentation, there's a 15% rule of thumb for treatment areas. Is that annually, biannually? Because we heard earlier this morning, you've got to treat about 40% of the fuel load to, to make a significant change. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question that I don't know the answer to. When we're done, I'm going to dive into that stack of paper and find it for you. 
Thanks for the presentation. I was, um, I'm Sonia Chavez of the Upper Gunnison River Water Conservancy District. I was really pleased to see using uh, beaver dam analogs across your landscape to um, address wildfire, put natural breaks, kind of rewet that sponge. Um, the Upper Gunnison District is running a wet meadows restoration and resiliency program. And I know Wyoming and Montana use a lot of that as well, but it is one of the ways in which we are hoping to um, improve water, water quantity. So if you can re-wet the sponge, hold that snowpack there and then slowly release it, we think there's gonna be long-term benefits to our watershed. So I just wanted to mention that, thank you. You know, part of what I was saying earlier is about you know, generating social license and interest in the work. And sometimes we have our communities, maybe it's because of a level of trust, who knows why, we don't get a lot of comments, for example, on a project. And so, but we know we need community engagement and community support for some of this work. Um, we didn't anticipate it, but the beaver dam analog work seemed to really captivate our, our communities in, in their interest. They were curious about it, um, that these were volunteer projects. So as the, the four that we've done so far in, in the Buffalo watershed moved along, each one, more and more people showed up. And then particularly the one when our public affairs officer showed pictures of the baby beavers that were gonna get released and by game and fish, um, all of a sudden, I think every kid in Johnson and Sheridan County wanted to be there um, for fuzzy little baby beavers. But, you know, we have beavers in the landscape, we needed more. So that was part of that project was introducing those. But, you know, the, the, that wet meadow ecosystem on the bighorns is critical um, uh, to the forest. And so, you know, we have this work going on. Some of the other stuff we do is a variety of exclusions. We have a, a really, really wonderful and healthy moose population, probably too many. Um, and so moose impacts to riparian areas is pretty high. Um, and so we've got a variety of work going with Game and Fish to figure out the right sort of exposures. We already are really good at excluding cattle from where we need to from sensitive riparian areas and some of those wet meadow ecosystems, but keeping the moose out is another whole other challenge. Um, but we, we, our employees call it the elephant proof fencing. It's, it's pretty impressive what you have to build to keep a moose out, but it's working. That was a good presentation. Uh, I'm Tim Kylo. I'm the resource forester for Montrose Forest Products here in Montrose, Colorado. I was pleased to see that in your watershed treatment, you were able to actually access roadless to a certain degree. And we're facing the same issues in Colorado. Much of our high country, our peaks and everything are, are roadless areas. Um, I'm wondering if it's now not the time to start looking at a weighted average. What's What's more important, a, a healthy watershed, a fireproof watershed, if we can create that, uh, a watershed that isn't dying from beetles, or looking at roadless and saying, well, maybe we could put a little bit more roads in here and protect ourselves for a century going forward. What are your thoughts? Is there, I know that's a legislative issue, but is there any dialogue between say your forest and your reps in that regard? Yeah, that's that's a great question, and, and yes, we've had a, a a long running dialogue going, which which Jim knows a lot about. And um, a number of years ago, prior Wyoming Governor Matt Mead, um, based on the he had a what he called a task force on forests, looking at Wyoming forest conditions and and, and needs for change out on the landscape. One of those was recognized was the roadless challenge that the Bighorn has, with fifty plus percent of our landscape being roadless. Um, and interestingly, the way the inventory of roadless was done on the Bighorn has some oddities to it. We have 380 miles of open year long road in inventory roadless area. So we have some quirks with our roadless and that was one, you know, identified as a challenge um, as well as just the volume when there is a need to, to protect some of these landscapes. So uh, a roadless collaborative was formed, did a lot of work sensing with communities, assessing the issues out there in the landscape and came up with a suite of recommendations for either a Wyoming roadless rule along the lines of what Colorado has or even a Bighorn specific roadless rule. Um, the political capital to pull off either was more than I think that uh, that was available at the time. But what's important to me is that that task force or that collaborative group, which had broad based membership from the environmental community, the Wyoming Wilderness Association, for example, um, uh, to the timber industry, you know, all aspects of, of, of uh, interest group groups were involved, came to broad based consensus on some, some a couple key recommendations, one of which was an additional exemption to the roadless rule 
for targeted treatments in municipal watersheds, um, which we don't have. We can you know, do some fuels work, but there were really targeted recommendations that I think would help us touch more of those landscapes while still preserving their, their roadless characteristics and roadless qualities, you know, going, moving down the road. My name is Harry Perulis. We're in the ranching business and we ranch in both Colorado and Wyoming. I'd like to shirt tail uh, the question that was asked about the contributions that are made from the state of uh, Wyoming in your collaborative projects and the funding. Could you speak to the fact that Wyoming for a number of years, although it's off now, collected just under a billion dollars a year in severance taxes. And that funding was so available and so able to use for these kind of projects that it really put Wyoming over the top. And I think that the Colorado could learn from that because we learn what the difference in ranching in Wyoming versus ranching in Colorado. Uh, we have a demographic difference. And I think that there might be an awareness there that Colorado could learn from Wyoming is just to how valuable those severance tra taxes are. Yeah, thanks for that. Well, so while those severance taxes themselves are, is not a topic I'm all that familiar with, what I can say is that we do have good collaborative working relationships with stock growers and wool growers. Uh, we, there are uh, both cattle and sheep get grazed on the bighorn um, and we see the relationship with them as integral towards meeting our objectives in the landscape. And, and, uh, and, so, and so do our state partners, whether it's the Wyoming Department of Ag or Game and Fish. And as we try to work to balance um, cattle and sheep grazing for those producers with, with providing high quality elk and, and, uh, and moose habitat, as well as bighorn sheep. You know, we have bighorn sheep on the, on the bighorns, obviously with our name, not as many as we you would hope for a forest named the bighorn, but we have them. Um, bighorn sheep and domestic sheep is a hot button issue in a lot of places. It isn't for us. It, we have, we have a good healthy balance there. And that's because of the good effective relationships with the producers, um, who value those bighorn on the landscape as well. It's giving you a big hand, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. So it looks like we have about a 15 minute um, break and then the main session, the last session will be next door.